think my title is long enough? You know, <laughs> could, I, could I perhaps have, you know, Yeah, exactly. I know. Sorry about that. Anyway, well, here's a picture of the Royal Ontario Museum where a million years ago I did a degree in museum work and have never practiced in a museum but have retained some of that outlook. Okay. This is the um, catalogue of the exhibition that I went to see last May in Karlsruhe in Germany, which was about Mycenae, the epic world of Agamemnon. Um, and uh, it had the most fantastic array of stuff in it, and I was very, very excited. Um, and, but, but there were issues, as uh, hence this talk. So here's a bit about the structure. So I'm going to say very little about sexism and Orientalism, but a, a bit. Um, and a bit about othering and smothering. And um, one of the things that I, um, I realized was that a lot of this is from, in, at least in my talk, is to do with agency. So who gets to decide things? Um, and um, or to whom do we describe agency? And I wondered about having a sort of Lucia Nixon test, like the Alison Bechdel test for movies, you know, just, just to make us all realize, you know, to, to check, to check who, who, who is getting the agency in, in, in whatever area it might be. So an agency is both people in the past and people in the present. That would be us, because we are the ones who are responsible for all of this. Okay, so, um, all right, well, sexism in archaeology, this will be brief. My example is the difficulty of getting um, representation of female archaeologists on Wikipedia with the constant pushback from people saying they're not notable enough. I'm sure we are all familiar with this. And a big thank you to Victoria Leonard, who's been doing a lot of work on this. All right, now Orientalism in Greece. This is this is this is very special, and not in a good way. So Michael Hertzfeld wrote this book in 1987 um, through, um, through, through the Looking Glass. You can see the title there, and he drew up this list of um, binary oppositions. It was too early to call it intersectional. Um, we'll get to that. And so here we have it: male, female. Helen Romeos. Ro uh, Romeos is not the pure Helene of the classical past but rather a rather you know, a sort of a more impure and oriental because of the brushes with um, the Ottoman um, government that ruled in various parts of Greece for differing lengths of time, depending on where you were. Um, so, and I'll just say 1987, the book publication, uh, Greece joined the European Union in 1981. So anyway, and I also, this is my little tribute to Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who invented the term intersectionality when I lifted this great big quote off Wikipedia. Um, I don't know who wrote it, but anyway, because it's very important to remember who introduced that term and why she did it. It was to do with being both black and female and the way those two um, qualities reinforce one another. So, all right, and a very brief um, word about attitudes towards the past in Greece. So this is Acropolis then and now. Um, after um, the Greek state was formed in 1821, the Greek archaeological service was set up fairly quickly, and one of their major foci was the Acropolis at Athens. And um, at the time, after 1821, there was still the Frankish Tower on the Acropolis, and there was a mosque inside the Parthenon. Um, so, you know, nowadays when you go to the Acropolis on the right, you do not see either of these things because they were removed. And what was the point of this? The point of this was a chronology of desire, a very particular chronology of desire, um, that said we can't have anything that doesn't belong to the very, very pure, very Hellenic 5th century BC. So everything else pretty much had to go. Not quite everything else, but anyway, enough. So when you, when you look at it, what you see is this you know, the Periclean um, building program of the 5th century um, BC. And this concept of chronology of desires is, is quite important because we all know people choose the past that they want and they choose what to remember and they choose what to forget. So, all right, um, the very toxic um, heritage of Orientalism, both inside and outside Greece, here it is. Um, modern Greeks sometimes feel they don't measure up and non-Greeks have had a very, very pronounced tendency sometimes to regard modern Greeks as the unworthy inheritors of the classical past. And this, of course, is part of the debates on whether or not the Parthenon marbles should um, go back to Greece. All right, so that's a little scene setting. Anyway, I go into the exhibition. I'm all excited. We're in Karlsruhe now. We're in Germany. Um, I'm thinking this is going to be really, really great. And then I begin to see um, photographs of archaeologists. 
And I immediately, being an extremely grumpy old woman, you know, sort of flew into a rage um, because here they are. Um, and I'm not saying that these people didn't make major contributions to Mycenaean archaeology, okay? They did. But there are five of them. Um, there's only one Greek person who got a photograph. Um, and uh, there, aren't, there aren't any women, um, which is absolutely extraordinary. So let me just do a bit of visual rectifying very quickly. All right, so this is uh, Alice Kober, and she did major work, um, which eventually led to this, the decipherment of Linear B. Linear B is a Bronze Age script, which turned out to be a form of Greek. And this decipherment of Linear B, A at all, B as a form of Greek is incredibly important. Anyway, this is her work, and there she is, and look how early she died, absolutely awful. Um, and this is Vasilis Aravandinos, who um, presided over archaeology in the major center of Thebes for decades and decades. And these are, these are rather artisanal photos that I took on my phone um, out of the exhibition catalog. So you can see that you know, the stuff was actually in the catalog. Lovely ivory um, griffin-headed doodah for the end of a scepter. <sighs> Maria Andrea Daki Vlazaki, I'm not going to read out all her accomplishments, but She's a pretty major archaeology archaeologist of Greece, and I was, you know, extremely affronted that um, she wasn't in here. She's excavated lots of stuff in the vicinity of Hania in Crete, and here is um, a bronze razor from uh, one of the so-called warrior tombs. We're going to have more about warrior tombs um, in a minute. And here is Sharon Stalker. Um, who excavated the Griffin Warrior Tomb at Pylos in, in 2015, an unplundered shaft grave near, very near the, the later palace. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an absolutely amazing find. Um, generally, and here is um, a necklace, um, a necklace in a warrior tomb, okay. Um, uh, we'll see more of what else was in there in a minute. Uh, that might well be Minoan, might be from, from Crete. Um, and then if we look... A little bit more. Here is one of these drawings of the Griffin warrior tomb. So, you know, he's a he, and there are weapons. That's the sword. That's the dagger. Somewhere in there, um, there are some razors. And also, you can't see them in this drawing. Oh, this is the necklace that, that I already showed you. But also in here, um, as is um, <laughs> normal um, for these warrior <coughs> tombs, were um, uh, some of his grooming aids. Now, you know, this is really extraordinary to, uh, well, it's extraordinary to me. You know, I, I get the sword, I get the dagger, I maybe get the razor, but a mirror, and this is only one of several combs. He had a lot of combs in there. And, and these sets of assemblages are, you know, um, common enough that, that people are not um, surprised by them. Now, the thing about this is that actually bronze mirrors are also found in women's graves. Now, some of the identification of those women's graves is a bit dodgy because basically, if there are bronze mirrors and combs and razors and tweezers and stuff, you can see all the things here. Um, but no weapons. They maybe don't do the bone analysis, or maybe there aren't any bones. And they just sort of say, oh, well, this is a woman's grave. But there are enough properly, you know, excavated and studied graves that we know that women do also get mirrors. But... So here is where the ascription of agency comes in, because men can be both warriors and beautiful, but women can only be beautiful. They can't be active, um, and apparently, although how would we know? Because the question isn't asked. So this is, this is, this is you know, really, I think, quite a clear example where agency is always ascribed to men, always. Um, and, and there's this long, wonderful article by Traherne, The Beauty of the Warrior, writing about Northwest Europe, in fact, um, and, and more recent responses to it, where he looks at this whole construction of masculine identity and how um, all that grooming stuff was apparently essential to it, along with, uh, along with the weapons. But anyway, um, he, and, and in Northwest Europe, in some of those graves, there are also apparently some of the same toilet articles, but there is no investigation by Traherne or indeed anybody else since really about um, the, the possible agency of women in 
graves in Northwest Europe. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the Mycenaean world. So here we are. So um, can beautiful women also have agency? And if so, what kind? You have to ask that question before you can before you can get anywhere. So you know, it might be. It might be a little bit more complicated than, you know, all the agency is with the guys and women don't have any because they're, they're too busy looking in the mirror. So the guys aren't looking in the mirror because they have them in their graves. You know, there are, there are many, many questions that flow from this kind of thing. Okay. Um, and then in the, when I, <laughs> I nearly started foaming at the mouth in, in the exhibition, but anyway, there were these panels of text and one of them was women in pylos. And this is... The, the total text on this, this is all that there was about women at Pylos. And um, the Palace of Pylos is not only the site of the Griffin Warrior tomb, but the site of a zillion, well, no, of, of many, many linear B tablets. It's one of the largest linear B archives. And there's actually quite a lot of information about women um, in, those, in those tablets. So you get a lot about women being slaves, which they were, or de facto slaves, the word, the word is used. But you get only this little tiny bit about um, women and their roles in cult. And again, this is, this is just under, under examined, um, shall we say, even though there's actually quite a lot of information. Now, um, this is from Lisa Bendel's book in 2007 on um, the um, religious economy of, of, of the tablets. Um, and this is a, a, a compilation of information from different tablets where um, altogether there are um, 57 plus maybe two people and fully 25 plus one of those um, individuals where you can actually tell the gender for sure are female. So that's a pretty good you know, percentage, I would say. Um, and one of the things to note here is that there is this deity called Potnia. She is mega. She is, she is a very great goddess indeed. And we are dealing here with a system that had both goddesses and gods. And that's really important because we know that because the gods' names are mentioned in the tablets, not because people have been able to crack some iconographic code, which they may, maybe have not been able to do. But anyway, so we know for sure that there are goddesses and gods. And whenever you have goddesses and gods, you're going to have quite powerful female religious personnel as well as quite powerful male personnel. And sure enough, we, you can, there are female slaves of the day. Well, that's more slaves, but there's a priestess. And there's also somebody with a female name who is a key bearer. And this is like, you know, St. Peter is the one who has the keys in the Christian saintly. Um, well, pantheon is perhaps not the right word, but you know what I mean. Um, so this is, this is a major thing to be the keeper of the key. It means you are in charge of the sanctuary or whatever. So anyway, we actually do know quite a lot about female agency in the religious sphere. Um, and uh, there's more um, because, yes, in terms of political hierarchy, we do have enough words. So we know that men were, were doing that. They were in the upper echelons of, you know, actually ruling. But the role, the role of women in cult practice isn't just they're holding the key to the shrine or whatever. Um, or they're presiding over offerings. There is a, there is a link to the economic sphere um, in, the, in the Mycenaean world here. And this has never been, you know, sort of investigated in a, in a, in a well, it hasn't been sufficiently investigated, I would say, in a joined up kind of way. And one of the things that we, we absolutely know is that they were very much involved in textile production. And we also know that that was a hugely important thing economically. Um, and the only reference in Linear B, remember we're dealing with the accidents and survivals, the only reference in Linear B to anything connected with trade refers to textiles. Anyway, none of this stuff um, was discussed in the exhibition. So here I am striding, striding around in a rage. Um, what about the agency of Greek archaeologists? Well, um, we know a great deal more about the history of foreign archaeological work in Greece than we do about these are Greek archaeological work in Greece. There, there have been some accounts written, and I was able to look at some of them, but um, we, we wait for a more detailed thing. Um, and the foreign histories of archaeology don't always um, investigate um, female agency in terms of archaeologists. Um, um, apart from in Crete, where there's quite a lot of um, female agency, I don't know why that is, but 
never mind. Um, but anyway, um, you get my point. And I, I did look at the contributors to the exhibition catalogue. Um, and, okay, there are a million numbers on here, but actually there are a lot of um, uh, female contributors, a high proportion, and there are a lot of Greek um, contributors of both a male and female um, thing. But this is in the exhibition catalogue. It was a great big heavy book and quite expensive. Um, and so othered women and Greeks are, are invisible in plain sight in that catalogue, but not um, in the um, exhibition. I thought I've written this wrong, didn't we? The swathing's in the exhibition, but not in the catalogue. There we go. But most people aren't going to buy that catalogue. So there's, there's an issue. Okay. So returning to the overall question again of agency of female and male Greek and foreign archaeologists, what about perceptions of the Mycenaean world? Um, and so the effects of those perceptions on Mycenaean archaeology in general, and this exhibition in particular. And I actually had nearly forgotten that I myself had written about this in 1995. And so when I, when I looked at some other misplaced gender um, polarities, misplaced in my view, because it's not always helpful to polarize everything, you know, it, it, again, it closes off questions. So this is what I found. So here are these Minoans that I've only briefly mentioned, this, the earlier civilization that happens on Crete and the later Mycenaeans who start on the Greek mainland and spread to Crete. And here's another list where, and this is very important, these are the perceptions of the Mycenaeans after the decipherment of Linear B and, it's, and the discovery that it was Greek. Because as soon as people knew that the Mycenaeans were Greek speakers, they were going to be better, and everything about them was going to be better. Um, and they're also seen as Greek and European and all these things that you can, that you can read here. So, you know, the, the kind of smothering emphasis on a certain Mycenaean masculinity might not be so surprising once you um, bear that in mind. All right, so, um, well, I've written it all in words here. Um, so the female and Greek archaeologists are, to some extent, othered by omission or by lack of emphasis, so they don't have agency. Any questions they might have had about the Mycenaeans are smothered and simply not asked. And a lot of the exhibition materials pose no challenge at all to a very Occidental, as opposed to Oriental, um, and male point of view. And so this is, a, this is the double whammy of um, the intersectional orientalism and sexism of my title, um, such that the agency of women and Greeks is occluded, often in plain sight. They're right, they're there, they're there, but they're not, you know, they're not speaking to us. Um, and it's perfectly okay, as I said at the beginning, to display those photos of early German and other foreign archaeologists, but they're not the only people, either then or now, who are doing really, really significant work. Um, on the Mycenaeans. So, some take home messages. What am I doing for time? Yeah, okay. Um, so, might we con consider adopting a, a Nixon Bechdel test? I don't care what it's called, I would just want people to do it. So, who can be seen to be active? Or to whom do we ascribe agency? And using what conceptual frameworks and what evidence? I mean, we could stop just making this stuff up, you know. I get very tired of people making stuff up. They look at things and they go, oh, well, this seems blah, blah, blah. So anyway, well, it may seem like that to you, but have you actually done any work, you know? Could we actually just get beyond that as a, as a mode of um, serious analysis? If we're putting together an exhibition, we need to be sure we know exactly what we might be displaying. And I don't mean the objects. I mean the assumptions that... that the objects embody for us. Because there might be some other views. There might be some other, yeah, I'm closing in. This is the last slide. Yeah, it was good. Um, and it isn't just exhibitions that suffer from othering and smothering, obviously. Um, our whole discipline suffers as well. Um, if, if you don't ask the questions, um, then we can't get the answers. And so that's it. Thank you for your attention.